and welcome to the Arthritis National Research Foundation's Researcher Spotlight webinar series. I'm Emily Storman, CEO of the ANRF, and on behalf of our Board of Directors, Scientific Advisory Board, and staff, I'd like to welcome you to the Spotlight on Juvenile Arthritis. We're so excited to have so many of you joining us from around the world. Well, welcome to everyone. We would also like to recognize and thank each of our corporate sponsors for supporting our Research Spotlight series. First, I'd like to thank Amgen for being our gold level supporter for this series, and thank you also to Abvi, AstraZeneca, and AOPI for your continued partnership and dedication. It's because of our partnerships we're able to continue to pave the way for new innovations and learnings from our researchers, so thank you. Before we get started, there are a couple of logistical pieces of information that we wanted to share. One, this webinar is being recorded, and we will have it available on our website and YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Two, if you have questions, please type them into the Q&A. If we aren't able to get to yours, please email us at info at curearthritis.org after the webinar with your question. Now, I'm honored to turn over the mic to our patient moderator, Matthew Parker, to tell us his story about living with arthritis. Take it away, Matt. Thank you so much, Emily. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Matt Parker, and I'm very excited and grateful to be your moderator today. Um, this is my first time moderating something, so please take it easy on me. And if I do well, maybe I'll be back for another session. But um, just for a, a brief background on me for everyone. So I've been living with systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis now for just about 15 years. Um, and just more of a background for everyone too. So I was born and raised in the suburbs of Chicago and I have two older siblings, so I'm the youngest of three. Um, I've always been healthy and active through my childhood. And right around my 16th birthday, I came down with the flu. And I guess afterwards, I never really felt right. I kind of continued to have fatigue um, and that slowly um, or turned into more with the fatigue. So getting some on and off fevers, a sore throat, muscle soreness, um, a variety of symptoms. And that turned into the classical symptoms of SJ or Stills disease of the cyclical fevers, the full body rash. I then developed um, swelling in my heart and lungs. And so I was admitted to the hospital and going through the usual treatment regimens of, you know, non-steroid anti-inflammatories, the steroids, um, to disease-modifying drugs. And it took a while for me to really find the right medication that worked for my disease. Um, and so over the course of a few different, a few years, it took for me to actually find the correct treatment for me. Um, so I was diagnosed originally in 2009. And by 2012, I was able to, through trial and error, find a medication that worked. And I was actually um, clinically in remission in 2012. And so uh, all the great things come with remission and obviously getting my life back. Um, but I unfortunately had to deal with some of the permanent joint damage that occurred over that time. So I know it's hard to see on screen with my picture or just me, my floating head right now. But um, I did have, end up having um, complete fusion of both my wrist joints. So I have no um, flexion or extension um, there. I also have my cervical spine is fused as well. So I have no range of motion in my, uh, my neck. Um, and I also, both of my TMJ joints were fused at the time as well. So I ended up getting bilateral joint, uh, jaw joint replacement surgery. Um, but beyond that, I was able to uh, regain my life once I was in remission. Um, so after 2012, um, I essentially dropped out of high school during the time I was sick. So I got my GED. Um, I ended up going to community college and finishing my college degree at the University of Iowa. Um, I got a biomedical engineering degree and I was able to start my career in medical devices and pharmaceuticals. Um, so right now I still live in the Chicagoland area. I've actually been on the same medication um, back in 2012, um, all the way up to today. So um, it's been a lifesaver and life changer for me. And so I'm very grateful for the care team around me. Of course, my family, all the advocates out there, and of course the researchers um, and research foundations that do all the hard work of studying these rheumatic diseases um, and the immunology pathways. So speaking of some great researchers, it is my pleasure to now introduce two of them here on our webinar today. Um, so in no particular order, we first have up uh, Dr. Susan Caney, 
who is a pediatric rheumatologist at the University of Washington Seattle Children's Hospital um, and pursues research at the Benaroya Reacher's Research Institute. She is working to understand the role of human monocytes in macrophage activation syndrome, or MAS, and is particularly are interested in understanding the interactions between cytokines and, in, in, and innate immune sensors in driving MAS pathogenesis. And next up, we have Dr. Um, Patrick, who is an assistant professor in the rheumatology division of the Department of Pediatrics at the Monroe uh, Carell Jr. Children's, Re uh, Children's Hospital at Vanderbilt. She completed her MD and PhD in molecular biophysics at the University of Texas Southwestern Medical Center and followed by her uh, pediatric rheumatology fellowship at Vanderbilt. She now leads a basic and translational research program identifying and characterizing pathogenic molecules molecular pathways in juvenile idiopathic arthritis. So I'll turn it over to them who can actually speak all of those words. Hi, so I'm Anna. So first, Matthew, thank you for the very kind introduction. In addition to all of my education, I'm also a person. I have a family with an 11-year-old daughter, two cats, and one surviving snail. I enjoy working outside and gardening. And I think it's also really important to represent the fact that pediatric rheumatologists are really fun people. So this is a large part of our pediatric rheumatology division running one of the races where you do obstacles and dive in the mud. Great, thank you so much, Anna, and uh, Matthew for that great introduction. I'm Susan Canny. Um, I did my training in St. Louis and then um, was at Stanford for residency and now up at University of Washington. Um, in Seattle um, for my pediatric rheumatology fellowship and now um, my attending um, position. Um, I also do my research, as Matthew mentioned, at the Benaroy Research Institute, which is an autoimmune disease research institute in Seattle. Um, and I love spending time outdoors as well when I'm not in the hospital or in the lab. Um, and so I have a, a picture here with my two nieces when we were um, this summer in New Hampshire visiting family um, and love hiking and spending time with, with my dog who's, who's here um, with me um, in the Seattle area. And we go on different adventures. To start off, we want to just talk about juvenile idiopathic arthritis, which I'm going to refer to as JIA throughout the presentation. So JIA is really a group of inflammatory disorders with a shared feature that is chronic arthritis of unknown cause. Importantly, JI begins, the symptoms begin before you're 16 years old and it lasts for longer than six weeks. And it's important to know that this arthritis isn't because you have an active infection or a cancer or something else going on at the same time. So the clinical signs and symptoms of JIA, and you have to think about these from the standpoint of pediatrics. Think about these from being a very young child, one year old, all the way up to being an older adolescent and think about how these things might differ across the age span. The symptoms are joint pain, swelling, stiffness, especially stiffness in joints first thing in the morning or after you've been still for a while, fatigue, which is tiredness, difficulty walking, dressing, and playing. And in some cases in JIA, which Matthew really highlighted during his story was fevers, rashes. You can also have a loss of appetite and you can have eye inflammation. So you can imagine that a little bitty child might just want to be held in the morning when they wake up instead of getting up and running around right away. So those are, you can have really subtle symptoms. In JIA, there are different subtypes. The JIA subtypes were designed so that we could group together clinically similar patients to understand more about the different um, groupings for JIA. And these subtypes, they're not perfect and they are still a work in progress. Even now today, we are trying to incorporate the new information we learned from research to make better groupings of JI patients. So if you look at these subtypes, you'll see some that involve less joints, meaning oligoarthritis, some that involve more joints, meaning polyarthritis, 
some that are rheumatoid factor negative or positive, and some that are, for example, systemic arthritis or relating to psoriatic arthritis. Importantly, when we think about this, today we're going to be focusing on RF negative polyarthritis, which is what I'll talk about. You can see up in the top of the middle, the top middle of the screen, you can see a little girl who has arthritis in multiple different joints. You can imagine that this is painful, this can limit mobility, and this can cause long-term joint damage. And next to systemic arthritis, I'm highlighting what might be one of the characteristic rashes that we might see. So how do we diagnose JIA? The, we diagnose it by clinical history, physical exam, blood tests, and imaging studies. These imaging studies might include things like x-rays, ultrasounds, and MRIs. Once you have had a diagnosis of JIA, then you can begin treatments. The treatments include medications, and it also includes an interdisciplinary approach. Now, what does that mean? That means that there are many different people involved in taking care of a child with JIA. This includes the family, first and foremost, the nurses, therapists, for example, physical and occupational therapy. It includes multiple other medical subspecialties, for example, eye doctors. It also is important to recognize that chronic diseases and chronic diagnoses like JIA can have an impact on a child and even an entire family's mental health. So paying attention to things that may be going on that JIA is impacting. On the right-hand side of the screen, I'm highlighting some of the, drug, the drugs and drug targets. We think about medicines, including things like NSAIDs. This would be things like Aleve. We think about methotrexate and other disease-modifying anti-rheumatic drugs. We think about steroids. And some of the more recent discoveries have included things like JAK inhibitors, CTLA-4 mimics, and antibodies that are targeting something called cytokines, which we'll talk a little bit more about later. These are TNF, IL-6, IL-1 beta, IL-17, and maybe also their receptors. And there are more drugs than just this. And it's important to realize that the pipeline of drugs in autoimmune disease is robust. So RF negative polyarthritis is a clinical diagnosis. For this subtype of JIA, children have five or more joints involved in the first six months of disease. It is very similar to oligoarticular arthritis, which means less joints in the beginning, but then that extends over time so that they end up having just as many joints involved over, the, over a longer period of time. Importantly, these children are also rheumatoid factor negative. So my research focus is on RF negative polyarthritis, and I ask questions like, where do the abnormal inflammatory immune cells come from? How are these immune cells different in children with JIA? And how can we use information about these immune cells to improve diagnostic tests, to understand disease activity, and to choose the best medicine for each child? So we're going to talk about an immune cell, and this is called a T cell. So T cells are a part of our adaptive immune system that recognizes specific antigens. And an antigen would be like an immune cell recognizing a specific little part of something. And this recognition helps turn on a particular type of immune response. For example, if you got a bacterial infection, you would want your immune system to turn on the particular responses to fight that bacteria. So the T cells and the signals that they make, and some of those signals are cytokines, these can help cell-mediated immunity. In JIA, T cells can have inflammatory interactions with other cells, and they can also have inflammatory cytokine signals. So T cells are abnormal in JIA. 
But how do we know this? First, genetic studies in JIA found associations with genes that are of known importance in T cells. Second, many experiments have identified abnormal T cells in JIA patients, both in blood and directly inside the inflamed joints. And third, important and effective medicines in JIA target T cells and the cytokines that T cells make. So we know that better understanding T cells is important and clinically relevant for our patients. Yet we still don't know where these T cells come from. And this is a critical knowledge gap in how we understand JA, and this can limit how we develop our diagnostics and our therapeutics. So learning more about this is going to help us improve these things and eventually our clinical outcomes. So in this project, I focus on T cells, and I focus on a type of abnormal cell called an effector T cell. A T helper cell is a type of effector T cell. It provides help to other cells in the immune response by recognizing antigens and producing cytokines that activate other immune cells. On the left, you can see the general pathways that a new or a naive T cell takes to become a T helper cell. A type of T cell called a Th1 cell is normally important for fighting viral and bacterial infections. In JIA, we know that there are heightened Th1 cells. Th1 cells make an inflammatory cytokine called interferon gamma. My ANRF-funded project looks at the mechanisms of Th1.17 cell development in polyarticular JIA. So in the top part of this slide, you can see a new or naive CD4 positive T cell. If we take T cells from a person or a person with JIA or without JIA, and we stimulate those T cells, making them active, and we provide cytokines that turns them into a Th1 cell, we did this, and we, you can look and measure the amount of interferon gamma that these cells make. And what you see right below it is controls who do not have JIA and patients who have JIA. And what we found was that the JIA patients make more interferon gamma in their Th1 cells. Importantly, we also found that while the control cells do not make a pro-inflammatory cytokine called IL-17, the JIA cells also make more IL-17. This is important because we do not expect for IL-17 to be produced during, from a Th1 cell. So this helps us identify a difference between JI and non-JI immune cells. And if we take a JI sample, and here along the y-axis is IL-17, so the higher you go, the more IL-17, and on the x-axis is interferon gamma, the higher you go, the more interferon gamma, and you see each little dot on this square represents one cell, you can see that there are cells making I interferon gamma, there are cells making IL-17, and then there are cells that are making both interferon gamma and IL-17. So understanding this process is very important. I also want to point out that if you look at the IL-17 production where each dot is a different patient sample, all of the patient samples are not the same. So that means that we can identify differences between control and JIA, but also differences between different JIA patients. And we do not know why those differences exist. So the goal of my research program is to understand where these inflammatory effector T cells are coming from. You have your new or naive CD4 positive cell, IL-12 turns it into Th1 cells, Th1.17s and Th17s that make these inflammatory cytokines and we consider them to be pathologic cells, meaning that they are contributing to disease. And we have studied 
the different components that are important in this process. Some of those are important transcription factors. Some of them are the stat proteins, which you might have heard of in JAK stat signaling. There are other cytokines that may be modifying this process, for example, IL-21, and even other things that we are still studying. So when we look at this pathway and these pathologic cells, we are also working very hard to understand how does this relate to JIA chronicity and severity? And as you look at this slide, one of the important things I would like for you to see is the relationship between the different drugs that we use in JIA and the targets that exist on this slide. We have our JAK-STAT pathways, we have IL-17, and we have other cytokines that are being targeted in development in drugs right now. So this is an incredibly important process to understand and directly relates to our medicines. And though it's not the focus of my talk today, I'm also very interested in how a person's genetics or a child with JI's genetics might relate to this process. All right. And with that, I will turn it over to a discussion of systemic JI. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Patrick, for that wonderful presentation. Um, I'm going to be talking about a specific form of JIA known as systemic JIA, which um, Matthew presented his own experience with this um, disease. Um, it while it shares with other forms of JIA that children often will develop arthritis at some point during their disease course, um, they don't always have arthritis at the beginning. And instead, what we see um, are these systemic features. And this makes it a little bit different, um, both in terms of how it presents and um, some of the mechanisms that drive the disease in comparison to some of the other forms of JIA. So patients will develop um, typically daily spiking fevers. Um, these will often um, peak either in the late afternoon or early morning hours. Um, children will feel very unwell during these fevers, but oftentimes when they're not having a fever um, in that same day, they often feel quite well. Um, so it can be challenging to diagnose early on. Um, there's obviously many reasons that children may have fevers. Um, and so it often can take some, some time to diagnose this disease. In addition, um, there are no, at this point, sort of specific diagnostic tests. So similar to other forms of JA, it's a clinical diagnosis, and we have to exclude various other um, things that may be causing um, the presentation, especially things like fevers. So in addition to fevers, classically, patients will also develop this um, rash that's really transient. It will come and increase with the fever, and then it will go away when the fever goes away. Um, so it's really important, you know, when we're evaluating a patient for systemic JA, we often will ask families to um, take a really close look for rashes um, and if the children are in the hospital, oftentimes we'll ask um, the resident doctors as well to, to look carefully during the, specifically during the time of the fever, because when the fever goes away, oftentimes the rash will go away as well. Um, as Matthew described, children can get involvement of other parts of their body. Um, oftentimes they will get um, swelling in the lymph nodes, which is where a lot of these immune cells um, typically live. Um, they can also get swelling in various organs in the abdomen, like the um, spleen and the liver. And then um, it is possible, as Matthew had, um, to have involvement and um, fluid around the heart and sometimes around the lungs. Um, so children can get um, quite sick with this, with this um, particular diagnosis. Um, in North America, about 5 to 15% of the JIA population will have this systemic JIA, and the rest of children, the other rest of JIA children will have these various other um, forms of JIA, like Dr. Patrick describes, psoriatic JIA, um, RF negative or positive poly JIA, oligo JIA. Um, and this differs between different parts of the world. So um, in Asia, a greater proportion of patients who have JIA will actually have the systemic form. Um, so there is some variability um, based on um, various different factors um, that we're still trying to figure out. Um, about 40%, so less than half, about 40% of children will have what we call a monocyclic disease course. So they'll have an initial presentation with systemic JIA, um, they'll be treated, they'll get better, and this will never recur. 
Um, however, over half of children um, will have um, persistent disease and that can be either um, flares of these systemic um, symptoms. So things like fevers and rashes, you know, if they've had involvement of um, lungs or heart, um, that, that may flare as well as, as Matthew experienced. And then other children and sometimes the same children um, can unfortunately develop um, persistent arthritis um, as Matthew also experienced. Um, and this arthritis can be um, quite severe and um, occasionally require things like joint replacements or lead to um, permanent um, joint damage or fusion of joints. So there's two arms of the immune system, sort of two big buckets. One is the innate immune system and one is the adaptive or learned immune system. Um, and Dr. Patrick had discussed T cells, which are a part of that adaptive or learned immune system. Um, and I'm particularly interested and my group is particularly interested in the role of the innate immune system, which is thought to play a larger role in um, systemic JIA than some of the other forms of JIA. Um, so a particular kind of white blood cell called the monocyte is a focus of my research. Um, and we're very interested in understanding how these cells um, are both influenced by the inflammatory environment that they find themselves in in systemic J and also how they might drive um, the inflammation in the systemic phase of the disease. Um, I will point out that there is a, a recognition of an important role for T cells, um, both in the um, systemic phase, we're learning more about that, um, as well as um, especially in those individuals that go on to develop a, a persistent arthritis. So there is a potential um, complication of systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Um, we do not see this complication in other forms of JIA, um, the non-systemic forms, um, but we can see it in other systemic rheumatic diseases, things like lupus or dermatomyositis. Um, and this is called macrophage activation syndrome or MAS. Um, and in rheumatology, um, the most common reason that we see MAS is um, in individuals who have systemic JIA or adult onset Sills disease, which is the essentially, um, you know, if you're 16 or older, um, how, how the diagnostic category. Um, patients will have typically persistent fevers. So instead of those daily spiking fevers, they'll have a fever that's not going away. Um, oftentimes they'll have swelling of the lymph nodes or lymphadenopathy. And again, um, inflammation and swelling in their liver and spleen on a hepatosplenomegaly. And they'll often develop um, low cell counts or unexpectedly normal um, because oftentimes um, in systemic GIA, patients will have high white blood cell counts and high platelet counts. Um, and as they start to develop MAS, um, those counts will start to drop. Um, there's a lab marker that we commonly use in systemic JA known as the ferritin, and this is a marker of inflammation. And when it's very highly elevated, um, it can be a sign that um, MAS may be developing. All of these features can um, be altered by the medications that we use to treat systemic JIA. So it may be in times more difficult to diagnose and identify MAS in patients who are on some of these medications, but we have um, increasing research in the field to identify um, specific markers that we might use in those patients who are already um, on some of the medications that we use to treat SJIA. So I'm particularly interested in this um, understanding this complication, macrophage astrophization syndrome or MAS. We're still working to understand all of the factors that go into driving um, this hyperinflammatory state. Um, but what we think is that the background level of inflammation in SJIA, if the disease is not well controlled, may put you more at risk um, for MAS. And so oftentimes, at um, initial diagnosis, patients can have some signs of, of MAS and with prompt treatment um, that will prevent um, the development of this complication. Um, we do think that especially in some um, patients, a subset of patients that um, an infection like a viral illness or a bacterial illness may further drive inflammation of those immune cells, activation and inflammation. Um, and those factors together may set up this loop where, um, and I'm just gonna use the pointer here to um, point out to you that the sort of background inflammation, perhaps um, in combination with 
um, an infectious trigger may activate monocytes and macrophages. Um, when these cells become activated, they start to secrete a lot of these cytokines that Dr. Patrick had referred to, some that you'll um, be familiar with from some of our drug targets like IL-1 and IL-6, uh, but also important in macrophage activation syndrome, things like IL-18 and IL-12. Um, and increasingly, we and others have found a role for um, what are known as the type 1 interferons or interferon alpha and beta in this um, this, this process. And so notably IL-18 and IL-12 are cytokines that um, as Dr. Patrick had pointed out, act on um, cells like T cells um, to activate and um, rev up those cells. And when those cells are activated, they will start to secrete this cytokine interferon gamma, which we recognize playing a really important role in MAS in driving that inflammatory loop um, here. And so this interferon gamma will act back on monocytes and macrophages to further activate them. Essentially, uh, the, the immune system has um, trouble in certain individuals shutting down this hyperinflammatory response. Um, so in my group, we are um, particularly interested in this, these cells, monocytes, and macrophages, um, which are important in driving this inflammatory response. Um, so we are interested in understanding in SJA and in MAS, what role monocytes play and how they contribute to disease, what causes these cells to become activated and really understanding at the molecular level, some of the um, precise signals that cause them to become um, activated in MAS, um, how do monocytes and T cells communicate um, between each other during MAS to continue to drive that inflammatory loop and therefore places where we might be able to intervene? Um, and how do immune cells differ between patients who do and do not have MAS? Um, and just like Dr. Patrick, we're interested in trying to use the information that we learn from these immune cells to try to improve diagnostic tests, understand disease activity in SGA and MAS, and ideally to be able to choose the best medicine um, for each child and try to identify that medication more quickly. Um, so, as an example of some of the work that we're doing, um, we are looking at cells, specifically monocytes, from individuals with SJA without MAS and SJA with MAS. Um, so shown here are three different um, individuals. So a healthy child, um, an individual with active MAS, uh, excuse me, active SJA without MAS, and then an individual with active MAS. And similar to Dr. Patrick, um, this is flow cytometry, where each individual dot is an individual cell. And we can look at um, the markers on the surface of the cell, CD14 and CD16 are specific markers for monocytes, um, and look at how um, these monocytes may change in each setting. So as you can see in a healthy child, most monocytes are shoved up against that left side there. So most monocytes are um, do not have much of the CD16 marker. Um, in active SGIA, similarly, most monocytes do not have much of that CD16 marker. So again, they're shoved up against that left side. And then in active MAS, um, we see an expansion or a, a rightward shift of the cells so that many more of these monocytes are expressing that CD16 marker and um, are demonstrating signs that they are activated by this um, in inflammatory environment that they are in. And we're interested in looking at, um, we're currently looking at the, the individual cellular level to look at um, how are these cells changed by that environment and what are the molecules that they're making that may be continuing to drive this um, inflammatory state. We can also look at what effect treatment has on the monocytes and other cell types. Um, and so this is an example of an individual who had um, received several days of treatment with um, a medication to inhibit that IL-1 cytokine, as well as high doses of steroids. And you can see that while the monocytes are not all the way back up against that left-hand side, the amount um, they definitely shifted much further back towards that left-hand side. So the amount of that CD16 marker has decreased. And so the, the treatment for this individual um, is, is decreasing the amount of activation of those monocytes. So we're interested in looking at um, both the immediate treatment effects and then looking at um, 
individuals whose disease is quiet to understand um, how medications are affecting these cells and how we might um, best treat um, patients. Um, one of the other parts of the project um, is to look, again, as I mentioned, at individual monocytes and understand um, that monocytes are not all one <laughs> kind. They're very um, heterogeneous. They're very different. Um, and so understand what are all the different kinds of monocytes that an individual has and how might they be involved in this inflammatory process. Um, so shown here are just two specific molecules that we've looked at. Um, what you can see is that we've identified or four different types of monocytes. The um, names of them are not important, but um, on the far left side, you can see one kind of monocyte and you can compare um, the CD14 monocyte between this particular I fit M1, which is a particular uh, molecule, an interferon-induced molecule, um, compared to um, S100A8, which is a um, molecule that's sometimes used clinically to monitor disease. Um, and you can see that different, mono different um, monocytes express different molecules. So the CD14 um, expresses a lot of this S100A8, but not much of the I fit M1. And then you can also compare um, the red is the MAS individuals and the green is the healthy controls. So you can see that um, MAS subjects um, express a lot more IFIT M1 um, and S100A8 than healthy controls. And we're using this information to understand the diversity of monocytes within an individual. Um, to understand the different functions that each of these monocytes might be playing, and hopefully to have better understanding of um, markers that we might be able to use for disease activity, and also to try to identify um, ways to track um, response to treatment and potentially information about what medications might be most helpful. So to summarize, um, Dr. Patrick and I have talked a little bit about um, JIA today, uh, which is an interest for, for both of us clinically and, and in the research world. Um, it is the most common autoimmune arthritis in children. Um, so affects a lot of our patients that we care for. Um, there are important roles for inflammatory cells, specifically T cells and monocytes um, that have play a very important role in causing the disease and are also targets for medications. Um, and we're both very interested in learning about how inflammation um, and its associated complication occur in different S um, JIA subtypes um, and how we can use that information to develop better diagnostics and hopefully um, better therapeutics to be able to more quickly um, diagnose and treat um, individuals. Um, I would like to close, we, we would like to close, I'll say, before we go on to um, taking questions with really thanking um, all of the families and patients. Um, they are our driving force. So um, it's a true honor to, to care for our patients um, and especially all of our patients and their families who participated in our translational research programs. None of our um, studies of human um, cells would be possible without um, the generous um, donation of people essentially um, allowing us to take a look at their cells. So we're, we're very grateful for everyone who has participated in our research. Um, we both we work at um, different institutions and are both very grateful to our institutions. So um, Vanderbilt uh, Medical Center and Seattle Children's Hospital and Benaroya Research Institute. And we both collaborate with um, additional institutions. Um, so Cincinnati Children's, um, Cohen Children's Medical Center and Feinstein Institutes for Medical Research. And so very grateful to all of our collaborators. And of course, um, both of us are very grateful to the generous support from the Arthritis National Research Foundation, which has really um, provided critical support for both of us in this um, early career development. We're really grateful for that support, as well as um, support from another number of other um, foundations and organizations in the National Institutes of Health.
Great. I'll jump back in here. Thank you guys both so much for that. That was fascinating. Um, I'm sure if we were in a room right now, there'd be a warm round of applause for everyone. So um, I know we'll have uh, anyone who's attending right now can submit uh, questions to the Q&A. And I know the ANRF team will funnel those over to me. Um, but right now, since we don't have any currently, I will start asking some questions to our, our panelists here. So I will start off since, again, that was um, great to see all the, all the work you guys are doing. And how can myself and others stay informed on the latest research developments um, in these disease areas? Yeah, so so I, I guess I, I can talk and Susan can also step in. So I think that one way to stay informed is through patient-facing organizations like the ANRF. Participating in these seminars is one way to gather information about some of the newest research. Other foundations and organizations that are uh, focused on arthritis, and especially for us pediatricians, juvenile idiopathic arthritis, will often have announcements when there are research advances. There are conferences that often have a patient-facing or family-facing component. So by identifying uh, depending on what you're interested in, whether it's the really nitty gritty research or whether it's something that's maybe distilled more for someone who's actually experiencing the disease process, or if you might be a person who's a part of both those worlds, using the making sure that you join in those organizations, sign up for mailing lists or so that when things happen, you're aware of them, and then you can go and join in. And especially if you are a younger person, person who is still in training or in school and you, you're interested in learning more about this, paying attention to whether there are opportunities while you're in high school, college, or medical school, or pharmacy school, or whatever kind of training you're in, whether there are opportunities for you to apply to funding to maybe go to some of those conferences. So just kind of getting yourself in there, getting on listservs. And if you really want to do the research part, you can search on PubMed and you can search on Google Scholar and just type in autoimmune arthritis or juvenile idiopathic arthritis, and you will get a ton of new stuff. It might be a little hard to sort through, but that's another way to get into the nitty gritty of it. Yeah, I think that's, a, I'll just echo um, what you said that um, a lot of foundations and organization, the, the disease specific organizations um, provide um, distillation of a lot of the research. And then I think another way, you know, especially if you're a participant, um, I can you know, just speak for our um, organization. We send out like a newsletter every quarterly or every six months that tries to um, summarize some of the, the research findings. So um, if you've been a participant as well, asking about where that information is, um, how is it distributed so that you can find out about um, what, what's happening. <laughs> Great, thank you both for that. Um, kind of on the same research topic here, um, what advice would either of you, I guess Susan, you can start first this time on that. Um, what other advice would you give to uh, new early career scientists looking to be accepted um, to receive a grant and be a part of the ANRF? Yeah, well, I think the ANRF is really an outstanding organization and I'm you know, just really grateful for the support. I think, um, you know, first of all, obviously finding for me it was sort of finding out that this awesome organization existed. So um, finding out, um, you know, what are the funding opportunities for um, young investigators? And then um, I think speaking with people who have been um, funded by the organization um, and then certainly um, you know, if you haven't written a grant before, um, working with your mentors um, to design what your project will look like and, and um, you know, how, how you'll put that together. There are also um, various, you know, within some of our pediatric rheumatology um, organizations, um, there are some um, committees um, for sort of for young investigators to help with, um, you know, writing up specific games pages and things like that, getting, getting feedback on the the, the parts of the, the grant so that you can um, hopefully be successful. And, and I can echo, I, I completely agree with Susan. The things she said are all very true. And the, the last piece I'll emphasize is know what you're researching and know why you're doing it. In arthritis, it's very, for me, it's very easy to know why are we doing this? 
So keeping that big picture and that connection with the disease process that we are working so hard to impact and understanding how your research can impact people, I think is an important thing that as you go through that process of writing a grant and identifying exactly how your research is going to look, never losing sight of the big picture. Great, thank you guys again for that. Um, and I just wanna remind everyone on attending right now, you can submit more questions in the q and I do not wanna monopolize this. This is for you guys as well, um, but I will keep going here until we get some questions going, but um, Susan and, and uh, Anna there kind of just wrote the next question for me, you know, the why behind things. So what, ins what inspired both of you to become MD, PhDs um, in your research in this area? I guess I'll, I'll start this time. So I, I didn't really know PhDs even existed until I was, I went to a school of science and math in high school. I always loved science. And then I discovered, oh, there are people who are PhDs. And then I went to college and discovered, oh, research is a thing. And I knew, I'd always known ever since I was little, I wanted to be in medicine. And I discovered that, you know, in medicine, the more you start learning, the more you start realizing we don't really know everything. Um, and, you know, when you're a child, you think, oh, we have all the answers. And then you grow up and you realize, oh, we are missing so many of the answers. And research and science is the way that we can connect medicine with finding those answers and expanding the knowledge that we have now. And um, I did my PhD in molecular biophysics. I just love little proteins and understanding how they work. And these are a component of our, our bodies that can be in, is an important part of the disease process and an important part of arthritis and other diseases. And so that's kind of how, how I became interested in research and then how I became interested in a PhD and molecular biophysics naturally fits with that. And it's a basic component that's a part of many things. Great, and I will say I have a somewhat similar but slightly different um, journey. I was also very interested in science from an early age, um, a little bit different where I was sort of initially thinking about doing a PhD um, and did some research in, an, in a mentor's lab during college who was an MD PhD and um, really pointed me towards the MD PhD program and um, sort of said, you know, with the questions that you're interested in studying, you know, I really wanted my research to be um, relevant to um, to patients. And um, so I found the MD-PhD and, and it's just been a, an amazing fit. Um, I think that, you know, there's, there's importance in all kinds of science. <laughs> so very important to have, you know, basic science, but I really wanted the, the, the material, you know, the research that I did to really have more direct impact. Um, so it's been a really excellent fit. Um, I did my PhD in immunology and very interested in how, um, how the immune system works um, and how sometimes it doesn't work so well um, and found rheumatology um, during my um, third year medical school rotations and thought it was a really, really great fit for me personally. I um, like to be able to care for patients over time. So not sort of a, a one-time um, interaction, but be able to see um, how things evolve over time. How can we, um, you know, basically care for the whole person over, over the course of their, um, their disease and um, really interested in the, the way in which we can use medications now to target the immune system um, and hopefully have people, um, you know, living out, out living their lives all, you know, going to college and doing all the things they want to do and hopefully having the, the medicine part be as minimal um, a disruption to their lives as possible. Yeah, thank you again. It's a great learning more about you guys and your backgrounds too. Um, and so once again, feel free to add more questions to the Q&A here. Maybe I'll switch gears and I kind of hit a bunch of different things for the audience. I know it varies here. So kind of bring it back to more of the clinical side of things. So you know, we're talking about JA, SJA, all the other um, kind of subsets of those. Getting us back to basics, I guess, for you know, being a new patient going in there, what are some questions that the patients and the families should be asking the rheumatologists if, you know, if they're experiencing something like this? Yeah, it's a, it's a great question. I think it's hard to know when you're first um, 
going through this journey exactly sort of what what questions to to ask and I think um basically you know anything that you are worried about so I think probably most of us try to sort of to ask that question of, of what worries you most but you know oftentimes when patients express you know I am worried about um you know as I say like whether I'll be able to call go to college we can pretty confidently say that should absolutely be possible and we're going to get you there. So I think, um, you know, sharing what are your main concerns so that you can make sure that they get addressed um, would be one of the things that I would I would think of. Um, Anna, do you have additional thoughts? Yeah, I, I agree that making sure that the wor worries and concerns are so individual that making sure that your individual worries and concerns get addressed because it's terrible to be thinking about things in the middle of the night, right? Um, the other things that I think, um, one thing is when you are first diagnosed, keeping, trying to keep in mind that this is a journey and that one visit isn't going to answer all of the questions and you're going to develop new questions over time. So the first visit is not the only visit to have the opportunity to ask questions. So don't feel that you have to have everything perfect. The lack of perfection is okay and it's expected. Things that, you know, important questions when you're starting in medicine, there's all of, all of the standard stuff, you know, are there side effects that I can expect? Are there things that if they happen, they're really important to call the doctor about? And another one in rheumatology that's important to ask is how long should I expect before this medicine is going to maybe have an impact on my day-to-day -day functioning? Like when will I expect to see this, this start to work? Because our medicines don't always work fast. Sometimes they work fast, but sometimes they can take a while. So it's good to know if you are going to need to wait a while before you know if something worked or not. And and so I think that's one thing that's really helpful about medicines, but that's like a very, you know, there's so many different questions and they're so different for different people. Um, I think that if you have things like issues with also other issues that might, no one's going to know if you don't bring them up. For example, if transportation is really hard for you asking about, hey, are there any resources? Um, if health insurance is really hard for you asking, hey, we have this problem. Do you guys have resources that might be able to help us because many of us pediatric rheumatologists and other rheumatologists are in tertiary medical centers where we might have resources like social workers where your pediatrician just doesn't have those resources. So things that you might not even know are a part of the arthritis, ask about those things too because those things can impact your ability to get health care. And we like to try to work with families to see what we can do to help figure that out. Yeah, I think I know that's kind of a loaded question. There's a lot that goes in there, but I appreciate that. And like as you guys both alluded to before too, it's a journey. You know, I've been with some of the same doctors for 10 years now. And so still there's that connection, you know, they could do so much for you, but at the end of the day, they're not mind readers. So like you said, you need to tell them everything that's your concerns on your mind or what's going on in your life so they can help you with that. So thank you both. Um, I know we're right up on time. I'll ask one more quick question for both of you. Um, so why do you think it's important that organizations like the ANRF um, fund early career researchers like, like yourself and others? Yeah, so I, I, I can go first on this one. So the ANRF and research and research organizations like this are incredibly important because they do, they provide direct financial resources to support your research program. And without this direct financial support, you physically cannot do the work to make discoveries in arthritis and in other autoimmune disease. So it is a direct money to research contribution and it pushes the work forward and it pushes discoveries forward. Early stage researchers, we have to build something before we can become late stage researchers. And that's a really hard thing. So that money really matters. Yeah, I would just echo exactly what Anna said. I don't think I have anything additional to say other than the, you know, the funding options for early stage 
um, researchers are much more limited when you don't sort of have your research program up and running, you're not established in the field. And so um, this kind of funding at this sort of critical juncture in um, career development is really important for, um, you know, supporting us to be able to hopefully um, continue in this field and um, to hopefully make changes in the long term for everyone. Well, thank you both again for your time. Great. Uh, great presentations and clearly great direction for everyone on the call too. So I think I'm handing it back over to Emily now to close out the call. Thank you so much, uh, Matt. What a fantastic moderator you've been for us today. Uh, and thank you so much to Anna and Susan on your presentations. It's just always great to be able to spotlight two of our wonderful scholars and see the work that they're doing and hear about the innovative research that they're doing specifically towards juvenile arthritis. I think you can see firsthand the impact that ANRF has had in supporting these incredible researchers, and we're so excited to watch them in, as their careers evolve. I'd also like to thank our, our wonderful partners, Amgen, Abvi, AstraZeneca, and AOPI for their continued support of all the webinars in this series. If you missed one of them, we'll have them all available on our website in the coming months, so look for that uh, email shortly as well. Just a final thank you to everyone who joined us uh, for this great event. And thank you for all the questions, Matthew, and all the questions that were sent in ahead of time. If you enjoyed this webinar, we kindly ask that you consider making a donation today by visiting curearthritis.org forward slash donate. Every contribution helps support grant funding for brilliant researchers like Susan and Anna. Uh, so thank you so much. We appreciate you all for coming. Please remember to follow us on social media and stay connected. Thanks everyone.